Hi and welcome to Spooky Hours. My name is David Saunderson. Today we're talking to a fellow called Matt Arnold, who's the editor of the Christian Parapsychology. I mucked it up. I'm not going to start again. Uh, the editor of the Christian Parapsychologist Journal, which, as the name sounds, it's a, a, a the publication of a organisation called the Church's Fellowship of Psychical and Spiritual Studies. Now, like a lot of the things that we talk about here on Spooky Isles, they're interested in the study of the paranormal and ghosts, but they do it obviously from a, a little bit of a different angle than we're normally used to, and I'm very interested in finding out more about that. Uh, Matt recently did a, uh, a talk for the Ghost Club here in London where he detailed some of the, some of the aspects of the Bible that we might not have looked at and how uh, they, uh, they cross over into the topics that we talk about in the Spooky Isles. So I've invited him on today to maybe go a little bit deeper into the discussion that he uh, brought forward at the Ghost Club and find out, you know, Maybe some of the the, the 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 mystique or the magic of the, the what we do here on the Spooky Isles goes back a, a little bit further than we think it does. So, as I say, today we're talking to Matt Arnold. Hi, Matt. How are you? Hi, David. Yeah, I'm well, thank you. You? Yeah, good, thank you. I'm getting worse at my introductions. I think I just have to stop them because they're getting more convoluted and uh, they don't make any sense anymore. Anyway, the point is you are the editor of the Christian Parapsychology. See, I can't even do it when Parapsychologist I'm... Parapsychologist Journal. ...doing it. What's about that that publication? What, 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 what What's that all about? Well, um, it's a publication that's nearly 50 years old, set up in 75, 1975. Um and it was uh, kind of formulated because there was a uh, there's a group that I'm a member of called the Church's Fellowship for Psychical and Spiritual Studies, which itself is 70 years old next year and was set up as a response to how the church was being perceived as having absolutely no clue when it came to issues of things like the afterlife, uh, psychical research, um, psi all of those sorts of phenomena that often the church either was too embarrassed to talk about or hadn't got a clue as to how to approach it because it had just walked away from the conversation and as a result didn't really know how to recover what it originally understood in these things. How, how mainstream is it within the church, your organisation? Um, I wouldn't say it's mainstream. It's a parachurch organisation, so we're not one single denomination. We are a charity. Um, we do have uh, various patrons, including uh, Dr. Rupert Sheldrake and um, the previous Archbishop of Canterbury, um, Rowan Williams. So, you know, it has got a bit of kudos in terms of the, the actual um, membership and the running and the structure of it. Um, but we tend to kind of keep a, a fairly lowish profile just because um, there's a lot of misunderstanding. And part of my role within the Christian Parapsychologist Journal is to try and bring some understanding to this. What is the misunderstanding? You're all exorcists and you're all going around extracting demons from people? Um, that is one big misunderstanding, yes. Um, the Church's Fellowship does no exorcism whatsoever. That is uh, something that is not within our remit and we leave to people who are specialists and we don't even really call it exorcism these days um it's called deliverance ministry which is a bit of a wider term than um what was originally envisaged with exorcism and as came about really as a result of things like the film the exorcist in the 70s giving the wrong idea that exorcism is about head spinning pea soup throwing that sort of stuff um, I, suppose, I suppose my view of exorcism besides that film, obviously, is when you see these news reports from things that happen in Africa and other mm. countries where it all seems really quite violent and, you know, maybe really not on. How is that different to what, you know, the your understanding of exorcism or deliverance is, you know, okay. from, from where you're standing? Okay, so there's different kinds of deliverance ministry um, in terms of you have major and minor exorcisms and you have major and minor exorcism of person and of place. Um, the 
typical one that's seen in the public is exorcism, major exorcism of a person. Um, and that's what you often see on these videos from Africa and um, certain extreme forms of Christianity that uh, will bring them up on stage and do it almost as a show. Um, for me, that's not what exorcism is about, really. It's about the release of somebody from something that is oppressing them, um, possibly possessing them. But it is uh, something that needs to be approached very, very sensitively, rather than just uh, as a fanfare and uh, all the paraphernalia that goes along with bringing a line of people up and watching them writhe about on stage. Um, it should be a quiet thing. Um, it should be something that is a very last uh, resort, really, with a person, um, because we don't know what's going on. A person, in my understanding, is mind, body, and spirit. And uh, we have doctors for healing of the body. We have psychologists and psychiatrists and mental health specialists for healing of the mind. And we have the pastoral side of things uh, in ministry for healing of the spirit. And I think you really need a multidisciplinary approach, which is, I mean, my background really is in the Anglican system. And they have a specific set of guidelines that have been drawn up as a result of things like the Michael Osset, or, uh, Michael Taylor of Osset near Barnsley case back in the early 70s, where it was a an approach that was taken by the vicar, the minister at the time, where they went all the way through the night, pretty much, and then left the guy to go home having told him that he still got a spirit of murder within him. And as a result of that, he went home and ripped the face off his uh, off his wife and put her into bits. Um, so not surprisingly, the Church of England kind of responded by clamping down on it. There is uh, at least, well, there is one official exorcist or deliverance minister, as it's called, within each diocese across the country. And they work with a multidisciplinary team. I don't personally speak for the Church of England, but this is what I know from my studies. Okay. And uh, you said the word possessed. Do you believe people can be possessed of something evil? I think I have a personal view that there is personal evil out there, that spirits do exist that are corrosive to life, whether it is human, plant or animal and are some of them have highly destructive behaviors just like human beings in the flesh may suddenly sort of or may have a, a predisposition to being incredibly toxic to life um how do yeah. you how do you differentiate that between general mental illness then well this is the thing you see this is where i it's left to the experts who are in mental health professionals uh, and not just your typical church minister, um, who most likely is not a mental health specialist. And so that's why whenever these things are brought to the church, they should be taken as a multidisciplinary approach as opposed to, OK, we'll just bring you into a room and we'll just uh, do an exorcism there and then. I, I think that is dangerous to both the person who's doing these things and the person to whom it's done as well. And I really wouldn't advocate for that at all. This is something that people probably, I, I certainly didn't realise that you had a, a deliverance ministry, the term you use in every diocese uh, here before. I just, you know, it, it's not something you really think about from the Church of England. Mm -hmm. you know, I, mean, I know you're using the word, you know, deliverance, but we will use the word exorcist just for the, the sake of, okay. you know, that's what, so we know what that's supposed to be. Yeah. It's not something really you think about when you think of the Church of England, though. So is it because it's, you know, even back in the, I've just never heard that before, you know, whether it's the Church of Ireland or anything like that, it always seems a very Catholic thing. So does that mean it's not really done much in the Church of England? It wasn't done very much um, up until sort of the 20th century. Then it kind of got recovered again. And um, I think it kind of went off on a wrong angle. Um, the best person to actually talk about exorcism within the Church of England is a guy called Dr. Francis Young, who um, has studied and written books on this, um, including the, the Catholic Church and the Church of England. So 
he's the expert there, so I'll defer to him on that. No, that that's fine. It's just it's just a, it's an unusual thing. But which is all the sort of a lot of the things you said at the the Ghost Club. You you talked about the you know you had a very wonderful presentation where you back went back to the start of the Bible and you spoke about how this is what the beliefs or you know the the original writers of the Bible and went through all the way through to the New Testament and all that kind of thing. Can you maybe, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ask you to, you know, give a summary of uh, the paranormal in the Bible within the short time that we have here, but maybe can you give people an idea of, like, what was it like for the people that wrote, originally wrote the Bible? Like, could you compare, and this is like a test, how you compare the ancients that wrote the first words of the Bible to those that sort of revelations, the, the last parts of the New Testament. How were their lives different? How did they differ in the way? Because it does seem like there was a lot of, there's a lot of difference there with, you know, I'll, I'll let you talk because clearly you understand it better than I do. Um, well, we have to remember that the ancients, pretty much through the time of the formation of the Bible, were all into the supernatural. They all believed that there was a spirit realm, um, that there wasn't just angels and demons, but there were a whole plethora of different spirit beings that uh, existed. Um, in terms of the afterlife beliefs, they, they evolved over time from when you have the very early Hebrews that believed that you went to be with your forefathers and Everybody went to Sheol, which is classed as the underworld. Um, and then you start to get later influences from Mesopotamia, from Egypt. And they, they kind of get an idea that things are starting to change, that uh, the segregation within the afterlife, um, there's places for people who've been good or righteous, and there's been places that are more negative for people who've lived their lives just as they wanted to who've been oppressive and nasty towards other people. And um, so that evolves throughout the Old Testament and sort of what we call the Second Temple period, which is kind of between the end of the Old Testament and sort of the start of the New Testament, really. And then you get uh, into the New Testament where there's more of a an idea of um, this concept that uh, Christ descends into what is now called Hades at that point, um, and does battle with the forces of darkness, breaks open the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, and sets forth people who have been put into Hades, put into Sheol, and they are now free to ascend into paradise. Um, and then you you kind of get to the modern day idea of you go straight up or straight down when you die, but not really. That's not what the first Christians believed when they believed in an intermediate period. Uh, uh, sorry, not an intermediate period. Well, they did believe in an intermediate period, but they believed in initial judgment based upon your life, how you behaved, and um, that was your starting point within the afterlife. And then the afterlife finishes when the, the resurrection comes, which is a future thing for Christians. Okay. So do, do people uh, – I understand that some religions, you know, obviously you had the, the – the, well, I'm trying to do this in the most – Politically correct way without trying to trying to use it nicely because I don't, I don't like using the word talk about the Bible because Jews will actually say that their the the Hebrew Bible is the Bible mm. and then mm. there's all the different and I can never pronounce the word what's apro what's the word the, there's, the, there's apocrypha deuterocanonical yeah. and pseudepigraphal so there's all that as well so <laughs> and so I go with a very straight Protestant type of this is my bit so I don't want to but you you used a word and it was it started with uh, Shilo or something like that. What Sheol. Was Sheol. Sheol. Does anyone still refer to that? Um, an ancient thing. It's an ancient thing, really. It is a, a Hebraic term, and it just means the underworld. In the Hebrew, Hebraic cosmology, you had the firmaments, the stars, God above that. Then you had the earth, and then under that was the underworld, and then under that was the abyss, the deep. Okay, so I just I'm just trying to get because because I, I'm trying to wonder how you know Jews nowadays might see the world. I think they probably see this as opposed to the way we because I mean we do still see it as a I'm here and I'm going to die and hopefully I will go to heaven if I'm good and if I don't I'm going to go to hell. 
And I don't know that that's actually even all that an ancient idea. I think that's might even be a, a recent couple of hundred years type of idea. Is that right? Um, the heaven, the heaven and hell. Like, I mean, is that a Middle Ages type thing as opposed to something that's actually in the Bible? Certainly, the Middle Ages had Dante come along, who created a lot of stuff that is taken today as being gospel. Yeah. Excuse the pun, um, but. I think it really comes down to about sort of the fifth, sixth centuries when you've you've got some of these what's called early church fathers that start to concrete um, or dogmatize uh, the teachings. And I think a lot of stuff got lost in translation. And um, part of what I'm trying to do is recover or at least try and peel back the layers to understand what was the original understanding that the Christians, early Christians had. Um, but the idea of going straight up or straight down is, it's not foreign to, to sort of like the scriptures as it were, but it is, it's more nuanced because I think what's, what's going on within the text, there's a lot of things taken for granted. So when the text is being written, there's the implicit idea of, well, you already know this X, Y, and Z, so therefore we don't have to repeat that. Um, we can take it for granted. Okay. So I'm just trying to get my, my head around this because it is, it is. I think from what I'm gathering and through your, your conversation was over the years, things have been layered, as you say, layered on mm -hmm. to our understanding. And there's really quite a lot in the Bible that would be of interest to people who are interested in the paranormal. Mm -hmm. And uh, people t interpret it as they will. You know, some people see a, you know, a, a ghost, another person will see a demon, you know, all, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. when, when, maybe, can you maybe give us a bit of an idea, some of the more famous parts of the Bible that people would know from just their Sunday school or from, you know, you know daily church life or, you know, from their past that they might remember? That you think, can use as an ever, as use as an example of this. Okay, so I think the most famous example of a ghostly apparition is um, where Saul, King Saul, uh, goes to a woman who, in the King James, is called a witch. In uh, more modern translations, is called a medium. Um, according to Irving Finkel, one of the curators of uh, Mesopotamian stuff in the British Museum, he calls her a ghost mistress. And he goes to ask her to summon for him a spirit or the spirit of the prophet Samuel, who died previously. And in order to be able to understand what was going to come up with a, a battle that he had lying ahead of him with uh, between the Israelites and the, uh, the Philistines. So he goes to her and says, divine for me by a ghost. That's pretty much what the Hebrew says. Um, bring me up, Samuel. And so she does that. Um, she doesn't know who she's got in her presence. She doesn't know it's the king who's previously banned all of these kinds of people and these kinds of activities. So then she suddenly screams out and says, you know, you've deceived me, you're Saul. So there seems to be some sort of psychical knowledge that she understands who she's in the presence of and she's actually now potentially going to be killed because she's done something that is forbidden, that's outlawed by the death penalty right in front of the king. <laughs> um, and he kind of assures her, no, you're all right, don't worry. Uh, I, what do you see? And she, she says, well, I, I see ghosts rising from the ground. I see gods rising from the ground. and when she does that, she has a conversation um, and he says, describe him. And she says, I see a man with a, with, with a robe. Now, this always kind of puzzled me because you see a man with a robe that appears. She sees him, Saul doesn't. And suddenly Saul falls down and goes, oh, it's definitely the guy that um, I asked you to bring up. And I always puzzled on that until I realized that previous couple of chapters, the last time Saul and Samuel saw each other was when uh, Samuel condemned Saul for not carrying out uh, a complete attack on a particular people group. And 
Saul grabs hold of Samuel's cloak and tears a bit of it. Now, if you just read the text as is without any imagination, which is not really how we're meant to read the text, we've got to use a bit of our imagination with it. You can almost sense the idea that this woman has described him as a, having a robe. And then maybe, you know, oh, there's a, there's a torn piece on his robe. And that would be a key indicator to Saul that this was the guy that she'd summoned up. And it would have been sort of some signifier that Samuel had towards Saul to say, yeah, I am who I am, rather than just some impersonating demon, which is what a lot of Christians will argue, because they don't accept that human beings can have the ability to bring up the dead. Okay. And what do you believe? Do you believe they can bring up the dead? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I actually do. I think you can, with intent, summon uh, those from the dead but i i would basically urge caution against it for the simple reason that it would be akin to putting a big neon flashing sign on your front door saying everybody welcome leaving the front door open i mean you wouldn't do that in the physical realm why would you do that in the spiritual realm okay so there's obviously the, so the, what they could do back then is no different to what they could do now so you're saying that this witch or not a ghost witch. <laughs> witch or ghost mistress no. or, ghost or however mistress. you'd want to describe her would be your modern day medium psychic medium uh not even necessarily that so much uh i would say she was more of a necromancer i mean the archaeological material that we have um irvin finkel again did a paper on it back in the early 80s about uh, some of the incantations and some of the methodology that was used in necromancy to summon up the spirits of the dead from the underworld and he kind of speaks about them using a skull um to to bring this person in and um using an eye salve which looks like it had a psychotropic material within it to be able to see into a different realm um so if you put that on your eyes it's going to go through be absorbed into your skin and affect your ability to see in another realm that's the idea that that was going on there and i think that's the difference between what she was doing and what your typical medium today does okay are there other examples because that's that's a really good one you've just given us because that's a you know you know a nice little example there what what other things might people know that you see as a paranormal incident so i think one of my favorite characters is a a uh, prophet called Elisha, who uh, his more famous mentor is Elijah. But Elisha, I call the psychic prophet or the, the, the psi prophet because he has instances in his life in, I think it's 2 Kings chapter 5 and 6, where um, the Israelites are being attacked by enemies um, and Elisha seems to be able to do something out of the body so you might call it astral traveling these days um the first thing that he does is he's healed this prophet uh, he's healed this guy called naaman uh from leprosy and naaman goes on his way naaman wants to take some of the dirt from israel with him which is in itself a bit strange uh, until you dig into it more sorry that is another bad pun um <laughs> but um he his servant Gehazi goes after this guy Naaman and Elisha when he comes back Elisha says to him what have you done my spirit was with you and I've seen what you've been doing I, I, I know what you've done so you've almost got there an out-of-body experience where Elisha's spirit is going with his servant to see what's going on you've also got him doing what would be maybe a three and a half thousand year old project stargate where he is psychically spying on the enemy king uh, and being able to know the enemy king's plans to be able to help the israelite king formulate a defense against uh, the plans that of being attacked and then very closely with that when they do come and attack um 
Elisha's sort of like looking around outside. You can imagine him on the top of his house looking out and you can see this army of the enemy all around him and his servants going, oh, panic. <laughs> and then he goes, Lord, open the eyes of my servant so that he can see what I can see. And it happens and his servant can actually see into the other realm and he can see around him all of the, the heavenly army. Uh, that are protecting that particular area. So you've got, you know, psychic remote vision, you've got um, the ability to see into other realms, even the transfiguration of Jesus. Uh, Jesus meets Elijah and Moses. Now, these guys, Elijah has been what we call translated. So he never died. He was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind with the chariots of fire. That's where we get the term chariots of fire from. Um, but he also sees Moses and has a chat with them. So Jesus is chatting with a dead person in front of his disciples because um, Moses had died 2,000 plus years previous to that, something like that. Okay. So it's a, it, all throughout the Bible, there's instances of what we would consider paranormal activity. Definitely. Definitely. It, it is. When I first uh, I sort of asked you, I said, had, it, had the start of the Bible what we see sort of the Christian Bible being the, you know, Genesis, that kind of, you know, the Old Testament, and yep. then all the way through to the end of the New Testament, it gets a, it gets a, a, I think it probably gets a little bit darker, but then again, I've not read the Bible for a very long time. Is it the same kind of uh, ghosts or spirits happening there, or is it a different thing altogether? Uh, well, in the Old Testament, you've got uh, these particular spirits. Some of them are called the Shadim. These are what we call the gods of the nations um, that are assigned over particular regions. Um, in the New Testament, they're called the principalities. Daniel talks about the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece. Um, we've got um, a character called Satan who is personified in the New Testament, but isn't personified in the Old Testament, but alluded to. Um, you've got uh, you've got a transition in the understanding of the word demon, because in the Old Testament, you've got messengers from Yahweh, who is the Israelite God, and then you've got messengers from the other gods. And when you get to about 300 BC, you've got the the Alexandrian Jews are wanting their own translation from the Hebrew, so it's translated into Greek. And the Septuagint is what it's called, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And as a result of that, the, there was a problem for the Septuagint translators because they had to translate a word, diamond, which basically was an intermediary being at the time uh, between sort of like the heavenly gods and the humans. But the problem was that they wanted to differentiate between the, the messengers of Yahweh to humans and the messengers of the other gods to humans. So they created a, a uh, not a class of being, but a, a, a role description called an angel. So angel actually comes about as a result of this translation. Um, it just means messenger. So, for instance, when the postman or postwoman arrives at my house, they're a human being but they have a particular job and that's what an angel is. But also when you get to the New Testament, then you've got three classifications of the word demon. Uh, the first classification is one of the gods of the nations, which is what the philosophers do um, pretty much. You've got the intermediary beings that aren't from Yahweh. They're also called diamonds or demons. And then you've got the most popular understanding of the word demon or diamond is, um, the spirit of the dead, uh, which goes with the unclean spirits as well. Uh, so when you read the New Testament, you see unclean spirit or demon. The, it's highly likely that it's actually talking about the spirit of a deceased person rather than a non-human uh, spirit. Okay. You've mentioned a couple of times you use the word gods. Now, I've always been the opinion, I've always been the thought that there was one God and that uh, that's all there is. So... Mm -hmm. How does that work? How do they? It, it, if we look at this Bible, 
you know, the, the thought being is you, you know, throw away all your false pro- pro- gods and all that kind of stuff and mm-hmm. you got one. How did, how did that work out? Did it change from the start? Because I always thought from the start that it was always just one god all the way through the Bible. <laughs> and this is this is showing that my, you know, just thought what it was. It was, you know, that was, it was mono, mono, monotheist. Monotheism. Yeah. Monotheism, and it's the whole thing. And that the, the anything that wasn't that was the evil part and the you know, get rid of all that is all rubbish. So oh. where does this all come in? Well, this is a an incredibly sort of like complex thing. I'm literally just going to reach across because I'm just going to recommend this. This is a book called The Unseen Realm by Michael Heiser. Okay. Um, yeah. And basically, you know, you can see how thick it is. That's basically the idea that there are gods of uh, that are created gods, um, and these are spirit beings. These were uh, the the fallen spirit beings that were um, part originally of what was called the divine council, which is that God runs a bureaucracy. So God doesn't micromanage every single thing on the planet, um, but God devolves responsibility to human beings and other spirit beings to do particular tasks. Uh, and that's what we're, we're to do. And some of these decided that they were going to rebel and um, you've got the, the rebellion of the first rebel um, that we see in Genesis, um, which some people say is a cherubim. My research suggests that it's more what we call a seraphim, um, a serpentine snake type being, which is derived pretty much the imagery is derived from the Egyptian Uraeus, which is the winged serpents that are protectors of sacred space. Um, so he goes kind of rebellious and then. You get another that so that's the first fall in the Garden of Eden. Then you get a second fall, which just happens just before the Noahic flood, where you get what we call the Watchers, which is expanded upon in the book of uh, One Enoch, or the first the first book of the the book of Enoch. One Enoch is five books, but the book of the Watchers is the first book of that, and uh, that explains how. These watchers were assigned to teach human beings things like agriculture, metallurgy, all these good things, but they perverted their ways and um, accepted worship of themselves. And so therefore, you know, you've got all of this hybridization of angels and human uh, angels. You've got these spirits and humans and you get these giants. And as a result, these giants start to consume vast amounts of resources of the planet and um you know the, the cry goes up to heaven and then that's why you get the noahic flood um and then you get to the tower of babel which is another rebellion and these are sort of the divine council beings that are sort of cast out um you have to look at deuteronomy 32 8 and 9 uh, and you have to look at psalm 82 where god sits in judgment amongst the gods so if you read psalm 82 it accepts the existence of other gods but says that these are created beings rather than um, eternal beings. There's only one eternal God that is the creator of the entire universe. Okay, all right, that makes sense now. You've calmed me down. And that's that's kind of why you get don't have any other gods before me as one of the commandments, because it's superfluous if there is only one God. Yeah, okay. So they're all his underlings. Yeah, uh, he, he's line managing in them, and he's the most important one. Okay, so yeah. that's what that that's what that makes it. So it does, and so and they and some of them got a bit full of themselves and uh, went off and did other things, and he had to just remind everyone that, uh, hey, I'm the I'm the main one, and uh, everyone yeah. else, you know, is just the you know, don't worry about them. Okay, that makes sense then. So that hasn't really thrown away my you know my thought of all this. If so, you're looking for a technical word, it's called monolateralist. Monolateralist. Well, anyway, but they're not. Re- you're using the word gods. But they're kind of like mini gods. They're not god. They're not because I'm. I they're was thinking. Eternal. I was thinking more like when you see these sort of Greek myths where you've got Zeus and all these other, you know, all these Mars and all these other mm-hmm. bits and pieces. They've got lots of gods, and I thought, well, that's not how you know Christianity works because there's one god. So you know, that's. And I think there's a lot of overlap and a lot of cross pollination of ideas back yeah. in the ancient times. Yeah, no. So it seems to be quite, quite interesting because it seems like there's lots there. We see the sort of as I, I always keep referring to the Sunday school teachings. So when you do your, you know, your Daniel and the Lions Den, and you've got all, and you've got Noah's Ark, and you've got bits, all these things, little stories. But in between, and all the sort of stuff that's probably 
for kids is probably seen a little bit boring because, as you said, that that story about Saul going and seeing the the, the ghost, you know, whisper or whatever you want to call her, uh, you wouldn't get that in a kids' book. Whereas, uh, the, well, I'm actually writing one now. <laughs> well, even awesome then. Tell me about that. Well, um, so I've just finished a big book um, that's gone off to the publisher um, on ghosts, spirits, and the afterlife in the Bible. So that's that's a heavyweight tome. It, didn't achieve everything that I wanted to achieve, but that's going to be volume two, I hope. Um, but in the meantime, I've got a friend who's very much into art and a bit like Quentin Blake, if, if you know Quentin yeah, Blake. Yeah, absolutely. Artwork. Of course we do, yeah. Um, so he does uh, artwork like that. And he's kind of done some stuff for me uh, when I did a piece on my website um, about Daniel, the Holy Ghostbuster. And uh, one of the, it's one of the stories that's in the um, the Deuterocanonicals, or it's um, called Bell and the Dragon, uh, Daniel chapter thirteen, which you won't find in a Protestant Bible, um, sadly. But it's um, where Daniel takes a um, the, Bell is the god that's being worshipped by the uh, by the king, and. The king puts the, the, all the food laid out for uh, in the temple of Bell and uh, claims that Bell is real because, look, the food disappears overnight. So Daniel's going, uh, I don't think so, um, and sprinkles ashes on the floor, gets the king to seal it. And in the morning, the king, they t- break open the seal, they walk in and they see, oh, look, the food's gone. And the king's going, look, Bell's real. And Daniel's going, look at the footprints on the floor. And it turns out that it was the priests and their families who were going in overnight eating the food. And uh, yeah, so the king doesn't get very pleased with them and they end up losing their lives. Um, but so my friend did the artwork for that. I wanted Daniel with a like a proton pack like for the Ghostbusters. Um, but he's, that is, he's that asked me to... Sorry. Go no, no, go on, go on. No, so he's asked me to do some uh, stories like that. So I've done Saul and the Medium of uh, the Ghost Mistress of Endor. Um, and hopefully the, the publisher, they've shown an interest in. So I've got to, before Christmas, get this chapter finished as a, a prototype. Um, but it will include some dark stuff in there because it's aimed for early teenagers. Okay, well, you've just thrown out what exactly, exactly what I said before about that this is the stuff you would get in a kid's book, but you're making a kid's book, and it actually sounds like really classic paranormal investigator type stuff that he was doing. Oh, yeah, definitely. Putting, I mean, putting, it's, it's putting ashes earliest, down talcum right? powder or whatever you want to do. Exactly, yeah. So that, that's that's awesome. So you've got those those two books coming out, or well, a few books coming out. What have you got coming for the uni year? It's nearly Christmas, so as you say, it's where it's getting snowy outside, and you know we're all getting a, having fun out. So what are you going to be doing for uh, 2023? 2023 is the 70th anniversary of the Church's Fellowship for Psychical and Spiritual Studies, and as a result, we're going on a tour. So we are planning um, to have a series of events all around the country in different places where we'll do talks and uh, showcase the sorts of the ideas and what the work of the fellowship does and can offer to people. Um, so, yeah, we're kind of going public a bit more, trying to come out of the shadows, especially as there's so much interest now in the paranormal that uh, and the church is just going, don't know what to do with it. Yeah. So we're going, actually, we kind of, we're going to break the conversation open and uh, let's have let's talk about ghosts in the bible let's talk about the weird stuff in the bible because it's spooky as heck it is spooky as heck and that's why we've got you here talking so I'm, I'm i want to have you back on the show uh another time because i'm gonna to have to do a bit more study and it's just really show the gaps in my knowledge and uh but i you know even though i did sit and listen to your conversation your uh, talk at the ghost hub which was fascinating and i'm assuming that's not dissimilar to what you might do in in this road show that you're going to be doing next year. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, definitely. And and I mean, if people want to find out more about the kind of the theological stuff, because I'm kind of the theologian uh, side of things, I kind of like to do the deep dive stuff. And so my sort of website is go uh, ghostschoolsandgod.co.uk, and that's kind of a uh, laying out the groundwork, as it were, and batting back some of the the accusations 
that the Bible says to stay away from this stuff. And I'm saying the Bible doesn't say to stay away from it. It just says test it like we would with any critical thinking that we have in any paranormal investigation. We have to test every piece of evidence. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll put all these links uh, in the in the show notes. But you mentioned a couple of books. It would be really good to be able to put some links there so people can find that and read a little bit more and maybe and link to your website and, uh, and, and people can find out more. And then hopefully in the new year when you do get some dates for – around Britain when you're going to be doing your I'm going to call it your tour uh, we'll uh, we'll promote that as well so people can go in and find out more so once again thank you very much and I hope you have a very lovely Christmas and you have a great Christmas too David no worries you have a great one thank see you. ya bye 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 <laughs>